We're going to continue our series through 1 Samuel. And this week, Angus is going to come and read the next portion we're on, which is in 1 Samuel 9, verses 1 to 27. 1 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 to 27. There was a Benjamin Geminite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish, son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Ben Korath, son of Aphir of Benjamin. Kish had a son named Saul, as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel, and he was a head taller than anyone else. Now the donkeys that belonged to Saul's father Kish were lost, and Kish said to his son Saul, Take one of the servants with you, and go and look for the donkeys. So he passed through the hill country country of Ephraim, and through an area, the area around Shalisha. But they did not find them. They went on into the district of Shalim, but the donkeys were not there. And he passed through the territory of Benjamin, but they did not find him. When they reached the district of Zuf, Saul said to the servant who was with them, Come, let's go back, or my father will stop thinking about the donkeys and start worrying about us. But the servant replied, Look, In this town, there is a man of God. He is highly respected, and everything he says comes true. Let's go there now. Perhaps he will uh, tell us what way to take. Saul said to his servants, If we go, what what can we give the man? The food in our sacks is gone. We have no gift to take to the man of God. What do we have? The servant answered him again. Look, he said, I have a quarter of a shekel of of silver. I will give it to the man of God so that he will tell us what way to take. Formerly in Israel, if someone were to inquire of God, they would say, Come, let us go to the seer, because the prophet of today used to be called a seer. Good, said Saul said to his servant, Come, let's go. So they sent out for the town where the man of God was. As they were going up the hill to the town, they met some young women coming to draw water, and they asked them, Is the seer here? He is, they answered. He's ahead of you. Hurry now, he has just came to our town today, for the people have a sacrifice at the high place. As soon as you enter the town, you will find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. The people will not begin eating until he comes, because he must bless the sacrifice. Afterwards, those who are invited will eat. Go up now, and you should find him about this time. They went up to the town, and as they were entering it, there was Samuel coming towards them on his way up to the high place. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord revealed to Samuel, About this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him ruler over my people Israel. He will deliver them from the hands of the Philistines. I have looked on to my people, for their cry has reached me. When Samuel caught sight of Saul, the Lord said to him, This is the man I spoke to you about. He will govern my people. Saul approached Samuel in the gateway and asked, Would you please tell me where the seer's house is? I am the seer, Samuel replied. Go up ahead of me to the high place, for today you are to eat with me. And in the morning I will send you on your way, and we will tell you all that is in your heart. As for the donkeys you lost three days ago, do not worry about them, they have been found. And to whom is all the desire of Israel turned, is all the desire of Israel turned, if not to you and your whole family line? Saul answered, But I am not a Ben but but am I not a Benjaminite from the smallest tribe of Israel? And it's not my clan, the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin. Why do you say such a thing to me? Then Samuel brought Saul and his servant into the hall, and seated them at the heads of those who were invited, about thirty in number. Samuel said to the cook, Bring the piece of meat I gave you, the one I told you to lay aside. So the cook took up the thigh with what was on it, and set it in front of Saul. Samuel said, Here is what has been kept for you. Eat, because it was set aside for you on this occasion from the time I said I have invited guests, and Saul dined with Samuel that day. After they came down from the high place to the town, Samuel talked with Saul on the roof of his house. They rose about daybreak, and Samuel called to Saul on the roof, Get ready, and I will send you on your way. When Saul got ready, he and Samuel went outside together. As they were going down to the edge of the town, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to go on ahead of us, and the servant did so. But you stay here a while, so that I may give you a message from God. Thank you, Angus. As you can see from that passage, there's quite a lot happening there, isn't it? So we're going to try and 
pull it together a little bit later and draw out some lessons for some relevance for us today. <clears throat> you might think, well, what can that say to us today in the 21st century? A lot. We're going to uh, come before God now. We're going to come before him in prayer. So let's all pray. <clears throat> Dear God and Heavenly Father, how good it is that we can come and address you that way. We just come to you now, Lord, so conscious of all that's been happening this week, uh, what's been going on in the news, the current affairs, maybe what's going on in our own hearts, perhaps our families. Maybe this week has been a really hard week. Perhaps it's been a very good week, an exciting one, a joyful one. Maybe it's been a fairly ordinary kind of week, much the same as any other. But Lord, whatever has happened, we come to you at the start of a new week, a fresh start. We thank you for that. Thank you that new every morning, your mercies come to us. And so we want to pray that you will set us up for this week as we come to you now. Wherever we are, whatever's happened to us, that we might come to the living God, the ruler of the heavens and the earth, the whole cosmos, down to the very details of our lives, as we're going to look at very much uh, a little later in this passage. You are the God who has control over everything. Our lives, the very details of our lives, the seemingly even insignificant things are not insignificant. They have a place and a purpose and a part in everything that happens to us. And that is truly wonderful because it means that we're not insignificant. That we have no purpose. We do. And we want to come to discover more of that today. And so I pray, Lord, as we come to you, that you will set our hearts free to worship you, to think upon you afresh, to wonder as we think of the great God of this entire universe. And yet... A God who is not remote, a God who draws close to individuals, to people like us. We thank you especially that it's been made possible through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our mediator, our go-between, the one who intercedes on behalf of us and has provided this marvelous salvation. That is ours if we but ask. He has provided the Lamb, as we were thinking about just a little bit earlier, the true Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who takes away the sin of the, the world. So we come to you, Lord, whatever our background, whatever our state of mind, however we're feeling, it's good to know that you understand, you know about these things. We're not remote from you. You care about us, whoever we are. And so we come to you and we ask, Lord, that you will really speak to us today. Help us. We need encouragement. We get so confused and cast down by the things that go on in this world and in our own lives, the disappointments we have to deal with, the battles and the struggles, that sometimes we, we get worn out and weary. So we come to you afresh. And ask, Lord, you speak to each one of us. And uh, collectively, as we're gathered here, we thank you for those who have gone out from this place who are serving you. And we want to think particularly for Graham, as he will be traveling today. And a little later in the afternoon, we'll be leaving the UK uh, to go to Turkey and beyond. Thank you for his missionary work. Thank you for the gifts you've given him as an engineer. And uh, the fact that he can do much of his work now uh, at home in the UK. But there are times when he needs to be out on hand. We thank you too that though the flight had to be rescheduled, 
which is an inconvenience because it means he will arrive there a few days later and therefore will have more work to do. In your marvelous working, because of the later rescheduling, it means he will have more time with Jean, who was coming from the Seychelles and would have missed him. So, Lord, we, we thank you for that example of your provision. You have control over time, over aeroplanes, over different time zones, over our plans. You are truly an amazing God. And we thank you for this family and for the work that they've done for you in reaching out to others with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray for Graham in his time there, that you will help him with the work schedule. Uh, We pray for Jean and the girls at home as they continue to settle in their new home. And we ask, Lord, for your blessing on them. And as we think of them, we, we lift them up as representatives of many others who are involved in missionary work. And we thank you for them, Lord, for all of them who have been involved and engaged in various aspects of your work in different parts of the world. Thank you, Lord, for the way in which you look after us and you care for us. We pray now for our service here. We ask, Lord, that it won't just be another Sunday service, that we will not slip into that routine, uh, that we will just come here, sing, listen for a little while to a sermon, uh, pray and then leave, have some coffee and leave. Lord, we want more than that. We realize, Lord, that is not truly meeting with you. And so we pray that in your goodness and in your mercy, you will speak to us, each one of us, whether we're physically here or or just listening, because you can. You know no boundaries. And our heart's desire is that you would speak to us, that you would touch our hearts and remind us afresh, show us afresh, that you are the living God. You're not a story God. You're not just something we've conjured up. You are real. And we want to engage with you. And we want to know you. So help us, Lord, as we continue in this service, that it may not just be another Sunday, but it will truly be an encounter with the living God. And that that will change our our lives, change our hearts, change our way of thinking, lift our spirits encourage us, remind us afresh that we are not just insignificant bits of cosmic dust. We do matter. We have purpose. We have feelings. And if we come to you on your terms through your son, we have a most glorious future beyond our imagination. So touch each of our lives, we pray today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to come to God's word now, and uh, just before, let's, let's just pray, let's ask that God will speak to us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for those words as we sung salvation's song, that you are a God who is there, a God before time, and a God after time, and a God who controls everything. Some people find that rather a terrifying thought. I find it a glorious thought that you are such a God. We're not dependent on chance or quirks of fate. We have a living God. And Lord, we pray that you speak to us today through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, for those who may not be aware, we are working through 1 Samuel. And uh, it comes up with some quite interesting narratives. uh, But it's good to get hold of these Old Testament passages and stories. Uh, Some of them we're quite familiar from maybe Sunday school backgrounds, but they're not just stories. They do have something to say to us today because it's God's word. It's the living word. These are not just histories. They are that, but they're much more than that. So we come to chapter nine and we're going to be considering uh, Saul And how he is now going to be center stage and brought into this new position as the first king of Israel. But before that, I want to start by posing a question. Coincidences. We say there are coincidences 
and we talk about them often and we experience what appears to be coincidences, some strange event, some quirk that we can't quite account for. Well, what is a definition? It's supposed to be a coincidence, a remarkable occurrence, concurrence, sorry, of events or circumstances without apparent causal connection. They're not connected. And we say, oh, what a coincidence. Uh, Really, to say, though, that there's no connection, there's no cause, how then does it happen? The synonyms for coincidence are things like uh, accident, luck, fluke, a quirk, a twist of fate. Maybe sometimes we found ourselves dangerously near to mentioning and using terms like that. But really, something has to make a coincidence. You either have a belief in some blind, random, impersonal power controlling your lives, such as luck or fate or the stars, or the only alternative is to believe in a personal, living, all-powerful God who is controlling your life. And this being, of course, is creator God. Now, the choice, of course, is yours. But I know what I would prefer, and indeed, what I believe in, and I believe is true in this world and in this entire cosmos. A true believer cannot really believe in coincidences. They are nonsensical. This means, then, that our lives must be entirely in God's hands. And for me, I find that really comforting. I don't want to be at the mercy of the whim of impersonal, random cosmic forces. I find that rather nightmarish. I don't believe in coincidences. But I do believe in God instances. And this chapter is a wonderful example of such. It tells us in no uncertain terms that we are not accidents in a meaningless universe of chaos. But we are created beings with purpose, with dignity, with hope, and with destiny. So let's look at this fascinating chapter. Now, to be fair, we need to step back and look at the bigger story, which is really that Israel has rejected God in many ways. They want a king, but they want a king like other nations. And we looked at that last week when Jimmy was preaching about this rejection of God as their king. They wanted to be like everyone else. That's got a very familiar ring, hasn't it? To be like everyone else. We find ourselves wanting to be like others. It's a powerful force that works in our society. We want to be like others. And these Israelites were no different. They too wanted to be like everyone else. And we saw that uh, when one generation comes, uh, they can change the mood of the nation from what the previous generation is. We all know about the generation uh, conflict that we all face, and we've all done it, haven't we, with our older generation and with the younger generation. There's a new ideas coming in. Well, here they wanted to have a king like all the other nations around them. And uh, Samuel was upset and God said, they're not rejecting you, Samuel, so much as rejecting me. Now, asking for a king was not wrong in and of itself, but it was the way in which they wanted it and the motivation behind it. Indeed, if you look in Deuteronomy and chapter 17, verses 14 to 20, you have a prescription of what a king should be uh, under God's law. And it was God's intention to have kings at some point, but not in this way. Indeed, the Lord Jesus Christ is the king of kings, isn't he? So there was this rejection because they wanted to be like the others. Even so, God is gracious and he still uh, concedes to this request and provides them with a king. And that is where Saul comes onto the stage of this history. And he now, to the end of the book of Samuel, will be one of the dominant characters, along with David, of course. So Saul is going to be their king. God is so gracious, he provides them, even here, with this king who seems very suitable for the role. So the big story here is God preparing Saul to be the king. 
But in this chapter, we've got a sort of sub story, which I think is all about God's amazing providence. How he provides. That's what really the word means. And interestingly enough, Jen really mentioned that in her story to the children. God provided the sacrifice. It's what God does. But in a more general sense, of course, he's providing for us all the time. And this is a remarkable chapter that seems to open that up. So let's have a look at it. It starts with lost donkeys in verses 1 to 3. Let me just read what it says. There was a Benjamite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish, a son of Abiel, the son of Zerah, the son of Bekorath, the son of Aphia of Benjamin. He had a son named Saul, an impressive young man without equal among the Israelites, a head taller than any of the others. Now, the donkeys belonging to Saul's father, Kish, were lost. And Kish said to his son, Saul, take one of the servants with you and go and look for the donkeys. What a start to an amazing story this is. The lost donkeys. Young Saul, we get something of his background. His father is of some note. He's not extravagantly wealthy, but he's got some significance there, hasn't he? We've got his genealogy mentioned. That's usually an indication of a certain amount of importance. His father's, father's, so on. We know that he's got several servants, and he's obviously got donkeys, and no doubt he has some wealth. He's got some note, some position, and Saul is his son. And then he's asked to search for donkeys. And uh, we can imagine Saul perhaps wondering why he has to do it. Uh, You know, why can't one of the servants go? But little did he know where it was going to lead uh, to his kingship. But here we see God at work. God is preparing the way. And it's remarkable how all these little incidences do matter. The donkeys and the unnamed servants. He doesn't get a name, does he? But he's so important a little bit later on, as we'll find out. So I want to challenge you by saying there are no coincidences. There are God instances. And I want to name just some of them here. God instance number one, the donkeys getting lost. We don't know why they got lost, but uh, that was the means that triggers off this journey that ends up with Saul coming from obscurity or relative obscurity to becoming the first king of Israel. The donkeys, the lost donkeys. God instance number two, incidence number two. The specific servant. Do you notice there were several servants? And yet he says, take a servant. And Saul chooses a servant. How important it was that he got that servant. Because later on, that was a servant who happened to have a quarter of a shekel of silver in his bag. Another servant perhaps wouldn't have been right. God is in the details of our lives, even the seemingly ridiculous details. If you like, even the donkeys of our lives. Jesus talked about the sparrows, didn't he? They're so insignificant. There's so many of them. But they're not insignificant. And we are not significant either. No matter how you may feel sometimes. So we see that the small details are important. God is at work through missing donkeys and unnamed servants. It's often been said, don't they? Big doors swing on little hinges. Well, let's have a look at this servant now, because he's a very interesting character, isn't he? Uh, Verse 4. So, um, they they, they go to look for the donkeys. So, he passed through the hill country of Ephraim and through the area around Shalisha, but they did not find them. Where are these donkeys? They went on into the district of Shalim, but the donkeys were not there. Then he passed through the territory of Benjamin, But they did not find them. When they reached the district of Zuth, Saul said to the servant who was with him, Come, let's go back. Or my father will stop thinking about the donkeys and start worrying about us. But the servant, this is really important, the servant replied, Look, in this town there is a man of God. He is highly respected and everything he says comes true. Let's go there now. Perhaps he will tell us what way to take. Saul said to his servant, if we go, what can we give the man? The food in our sacks is gone. We have no gift to take the man of God. What do we have? 
Here's the significance of the right servant being there in the right place. The servant answered him, look again. Look, he said, I have a quarter of shekel of silver. I will give it to the man of God so that he will tell us what way to take. Formerly in Israel, if a man went to inquire of God, he would say, come, let us go to the seer. Because the prophet of today used to be called a seer. That's just a by note there. Put in for us. So what is happening here? Well, the servant comes to the foreground, doesn't he? This unnamed servant, seemingly insignificant to the plot. Suddenly, he's so crucial, isn't he? They've gone on this long, seemingly hopeless journey uh, for a donkey hunt right through the land of Benjamin. No success. Then Saul's natural and quite reasonable response is to, well, you know, we ought to really forget about the donkeys and start getting back. Our dad is going to start, my father's going to start worrying about us. But notice this, he's overruled by the servant. Now, I don't think the servant's been rude, but it's quite out of convention for the servant to make a decision. And he's quite clear about this, isn't he? He says, no, there's a man of God in the town who can help us. And then, of course, uh, Saul says, but what about money? We haven't got, we've run out of money. We haven't got any food. What can we give him? Well, it just so happens that I've got a quarter of a shekel. Can you see the remarkable hand of God in this? All these little coincidences puts them together. God is ruling here. God is in the small details. And so we see more of these, inc- these God incidences. It's the servant's advice He takes the lead. But God had planned that when Saul chose that particular servant to come with him and not another one. And that servant happened to have that money uh, put by. And so he encourages Saul to continue. Often, seemingly insignificant characters in a narrative in the Bible are highly important. Let me just give you a few examples of some that you may remember. Do you remember the servant again? In the search for Isaac's bride. We don't know his name. But how faithful he was. How crucial he was to the future dynasty of of, um, Isaac and and, and eventually the tribes of Israel. When he finds Rebekah. And what about Joseph when he's in prison? Do you remember the cupbearer? We don't know his name. We just know what he did. He just happened to be there. And he just happened to have a dream, just as Joseph happened to be there, who happened to be able to interpret dreams. And the dream comes true. And it's through that connection that Joseph gets released. But who knows who the cupbearer is? He's seemingly insignificant. Or what about the little girl who gets captured and helps Naaman when he's got his leprosy? We don't know her name, do we? But how crucial it was that she was there at the right place. Or the little boy in the New Testament that were the loaves and the fishes. An unnamed individual. But how crucial in the course of that miracle being worked through. And uh, when when, uh, the other soul of Tarsus is converted and blinded on the road. uh, And a relatively unknown Christian comes to him. Uh, We know his name is Ananias. But apart from that we don't know much about him. These these minor characters come in. I think that's encouraging. Because sometimes we can think I am insignificant. I don't have a big role in the church. I'm never going to be remembered when I've gone. No one's going to write a book about me or or have uh, people come round to to find out about me. You may feel at times insignificant, but look at these people. They're unnamed, but they all had crucial roles in the work of God. And so do you, and so do I. Nobody is insignificant in God's sight. We all have a place. We all have value. Then we get two more encounters, don't we? Even more uh, strange coincidences, if I dare call them that. Verses 10 to 14. So Saul responds, good, Saul said to his servant. Come, let's go. So they set out for the town where the man of God was. As they were going up the hill to the town, they met some girls coming out to draw water. And they asked them, is the seer here? He is, they answered. He's ahead of you. Hurry now. He has just come to our town today, for the people have a sacrifice at the high place. As soon as you enter the town, you will find him before he goes up to the place to eat. The people will not begin eating until he comes, because he must 
bless the sacrifice. Afterward, those who are invited to eat will go up now. You should find him about this time. You notice the deliberate writing there, the wordings, the, the, the time, hurry now, about this time, soon. All these um, important points being made. I think the, the writer here is making a point that timing is crucial. And again, we see these encounters, these so-called coincidences. I prefer to call God instances. Perfect timing. They arrive just as some women happen to be coming down to get water. And it just so happens that these women have enough information to tell Samuel what the next step will be, to go up to the high place. They tell him about the feast and so on. And then another perfect coincidence. They meet Samuel at just the right time. What if they'd gone a bit earlier? What if they'd come a bit later? What if they'd missed Samuel? But they don't, do they? Because God is in this. God is ordering this. God's timing is perfect. Now we need to remember that uh, it doesn't always match what we think timing should be. God is not on our calendar, in our diary, on our plans. We have to accommodate ourselves to him. And that requires a lot of patience, doesn't it? Because we sometimes have the temptation, maybe if we don't actually verbalize it, God is a bit slow on this. God is not under our time schedule. He doesn't need to be. He is working things out. What we have to do is recognize that and fit in with his time schedule. And that requires patience and great faith, as we heard, trust and obey. Think about Abraham again, when he had to do that awful, well, what seemed to be an awful thing. How outrageous. How was God going to work out through this? He promised that a, a line would be born through Isaac, and yet he's asking him to sacrifice him. God has his ways and his purposes, doesn't he? And then we come on to uh, the actual encounter between God and Samuel. But before that, God speaks to Samuel, doesn't he? Verse 15, we have these words. Now, the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel about this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him leader over my people Israel. He will deliver my people from the hand of the Philistines. I have looked upon my people, for their cry has reached me. There's an echo there of, of um, God speaking to Moses, isn't it, when they were in, in Egypt. When Samuel caught sight of Saul, the Lord said to him, this is the man I spoke to you about. He will govern my people. We need to stop and pause and remember Samuel's position. He was the leader up until now. He was the judge and the prophet and really God's spokesman. And he knows now that uh, in a sense he's been rejected uh, in that role and a new king is going to come and this is going to be the man. God points him out. God reveals him. Up until then, he wouldn't have known it was necessarily Saul. He knew God had a plan, but it is pointed out to him. God is so gracious, even in his details there, isn't he? But for Samuel, it would mean this young man was going to take the rule now as the first king. And he would be taking um, a slightly diminishing role, I guess. Um, he would still be there, obviously, as, as God's spokesman. But the center stage was now going to be Saul as the first king. And uh, God graciously guides him and tells him, this is the man. Sometimes God does work in remarkable ways uh, because of our weak faith, perhaps, or our lack of understanding. But, you know, we mustn't expect God to speak directly all the time. We've got brains and God expects us to use them. And to look at the situation, to look at the way God is revealing himself through providence and, and through circumstances and maybe through other people, maybe through his word, and, and, and work it out and think it through. We're not supposed to just sit there and expect God to tell us how to do everything. Uh, we've been created with minds and uh, are supposed to use them. Uh, but in this instance, uh, God makes it very clear that this is the man. It was so important that... 
uh, he, that Samuel understood it was him. We need to do that, don't we? we? Sometimes God will be gracious to us. He will help us in many ways and make it easy, but sometimes he won't. And maybe often that's the way we're in. And when that comes, we have to trust him. We're back to trust and obey again, aren't we? But uh, there's that great proverb, uh, isn't it, isn't it, in Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Saul eventually meets up with Samuel. In verse 18, Saul approached Samuel in the gateway and asked, Would you please tell me where the seer's house is? I am the seer, Samuel replied. Go up ahead of me to the high place, for today you are to eat with me, and in the morning I will let you go and will tell you all that is in your heart. As for the donkeys you lost three days ago, do not worry about them. They have been found And to whom is all the desire of Israel turned, if not to you and your father's family? Saul answered, but I am not, but am I not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel? And is not my clan the least of the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why do you say such a thing to me? And Samuel brought Saul and his servant into a hall and seated them at the head of those who were invited, about 30 in number. Samuel said to the cook, bring out the piece of meat I gave you, the one I told you to lay aside. So the cook took up the leg with what was on it and set it in front of Saul. Samuel said, here is what has been kept for you. Eat because it was set aside for you for this occasion. From the time I said I have invited guests, and Saul dined with Samuel that day. Here's a remarkable encounter, isn't there? Saul and Samuel. They were going to have many encounters. Uh, Their friendship uh, started well. Uh, Sadly, as Saul changed, things started to go sour, but that's much later on. At the moment here, Samuel is graciously honoring Saul, in many ways, he he says to go before him. That's an indication of the role he was to have. This meal that was being set aside for him, the portion of meat, these are all indications of the future position that Saul was going to have. You can imagine Saul, though, is a bit bewildered. I mean, you know, a few days ago, he was looking for donkeys. And now suddenly he finds himself being ushered into this um, feasting hall. And the guests are all there and everyone's looking at him and he's got the pride of place. What is going on here? I'm sure Saul is, was bewildered as he tried to work out what was happening. But Samuel starts to make it clear. And then he drops the bombshell. He says, you know, you're, gonna be, you're the desire of the nations. And whether Saul fully understood what was being said there, we're not sure, but... He certainly responds in a typically humble way. And we see this in the early life of Saul. He's a very humble man. There's great potential in him. But sadly, as as we move through the story, things change. Saul started off as a humble man. Notice what he said in verse 21. Am I not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel? And my clan, well, it's the least of the clans of Benjamin. I mean, I'm nothing. Now, he wasn't nothing because we read at the beginning, we have a pedigree. uh, And that's an indication that he was of some significance. And yet this is typical of Saul, how he starts. The man that God is going to start as a king, he was humble. Later on, we find him hiding amongst the saddlebags. He didn't want this position. He wasn't seeking it. He was a good man. He started off with such great potential. And uh, we see his humility, and and that is so encouraging in the start here. But here he is now being prepared and suddenly coming to the idea that this is bigger than he thought. This is getting out of control, perhaps. Uh, What is happening? Am I right in understanding that I'm, I'm going to be the first king? And then we have that final little section where Samuel 
takes him aside and talks to him. We've got it here in um, verse 25. After they came down from the high place to the town, Samuel talked with Saul on the roof of his house. That would have been quite uh, a normal procedure. Many roofs would have had uh, places for the guests. They rose about daybreak and Samuel called to Saul on the roof. Get ready, I will send you on your way. When Saul got ready, he and Samuel went outside together. As they were going down to the edge of the town, Samuel said to Saul, tell the servant to go on ahead of us. And the servant did so. But you stay here a while so that I may give you a message from God. And he's going to tell him. Uh, Obviously, we'll pick up on that next week. But uh, he takes him aside. They have this rooftop discussion. Uh, We don't know what the contents of that discussion is exactly, but we can surmise that it would have been um, Samuel giving him more information on the future. Maybe they were discussing the state of Israel and what was happening in in its religion and beginning to put on Saul this uh, position of authority that he was going to take up. He was going to be the king. He was going to be the leader. This was a massive step for Saul to take on. And uh, Samuel is preparing him uh, before finally uh, announcing this message and uh, as we see in the next chapter, the anointing of this man as the first king under God. When we look at this chapter and this detailed narrative, you cannot help but see God's precise preparation His hand in everything. Bringing Saul from a mere donkey hunt to the point of being anointed a king. But what does it say to us here in the 21st century? What can we learn about it? It's all very well as a piece of interesting history. But what does it say to us? A few nights ago, um, I watched uh, one of um, Professor Brian... Uh, Cox's programs on the universe. I don't know whether you've seen it or not. I, I've only seen one of them. It happened to be the one on the, the black holes. Uh, I thought it would be interesting to watch, um, to see what he's got to say. It was full of moody space music, shots of Brian Cox wandering among the abbeys and canyons and various places, uh, talking. The program was highly speculative, great CGI uh, graphics. But there was hardly any hardcore science in it, I have to say. A lot more romance, posturing and wistful thinking. I watched this episode of The Black Holes and actually found it helpful. But not in the way the programmers thought I would find it. Because after watching this hour long about what black holes could possibly be, and he spent about 55 minutes explaining them as best he could to Uh, Poor people like us. And then in the last five minutes, he said, of course, um, we don't really know anything about black holes, which I thought torpedoed the whole program, really, but there we are. And uh, at least he was honest with that. But as I turned off the screen, I found it helpful because I thought about my God. And I thought, how good it is that I'm not caught up with the tyranny of cosmic forces and black holes sculpturing the universe I have a living God. And I felt so grateful. I offered a prayer of thanks to God that I'm not in that tyranny. I'm free. I have a God who I know loves me. And what a contrast. And I guess that's where we're all faced. We're in one of those two camps, aren't we? We're either in the forces of this cosmic universe and unknown forces, or we believe in a personal God as we've seen so clearly portrayed here in this chapter. I was glad that I do not have to worry about black holes and trillions of years and what will happen to me. And it further tells me I'm not insignificant and you're not insignificant, as I said earlier in the uh, message. So what can we draw from this? Well, let me offer a few things before we close. Whoever you are, God is in control of your life, whether you believe it or not, whether you acknowledge he exists or not. 
Not only that, he's even in control in the insignificant things in your life, the little details of your life. What a God. There is therefore no such thing as blind chance or coincidence or luck or stars or anything like that. I mean, think about it. How can these things control us? Now, if this is so, and there is a creator, a God, then our trying to resist him is the most dangerous and the most foolish thing we could possibly do. Because sooner or later, he's going to get his way. In Philippians 2, we're told that when Jesus comes again, every knee will bow. Every knee. That doesn't exclude anyone. Whether you're a president or you're a nobody. Whether you're royalty or you're just Joe Bloggs. Every knee will bow to him. God will have his way in the end. So what's the point of resisting him anyway? But further than this, he's not a remote God, but a loving, caring, personal God who wants to enter into your lives and enhance them and enrich them and make them better. He's not a tyrant who's out to try and catch you out and use you like a pawn in a chess game. God wants to be involved in your life. He has only what is good and glorious for you. Why resist a God like that? He wants to give you your very, the very best. Now, if we've already trusted him and you're a Christian, you know this is true. And we're going to look a little bit more about that tonight as we follow through this theme. But I really want to leave... And my final words, with those of you who may not be a believer in this God at all, you, have, you want little to do with it, but maybe for some reason or other you're listening in or you visited. It's not impossible for you to not come to this God. He is open. He is willing. The, the gospel is good news for everyone. It's not an exclusive club for people who were born with a quirk for religious um, character. As if, you know, well, it's tough, isn't it? You're either one of these kind of Christian people who likes religion or you're not. Most Christians fought against God before they became Christians. They hated him. Many of them were atheists. Many of them were agnostics. Many of them said, I don't want anything to do with God. I didn't want anything to do with God. Although I'd had a Christian upbringing. And I guess most Christians would say pretty much the same thing. We're not sort of born with a religious gene. And that's great news, isn't it? Because it means anyone can come to this God. Anyone. And you might be listening now and saying, well, not me. But God can work in your life if you let him. But that's the hard bit, isn't it? Letting him. At least stopping and pausing. Can I plead with you today, just for a few minutes, stop and think, look at your life. Is it like Brian Cox and his colleagues say, are you just part of this great big cosmic confusion and, and really you've got no control, you've got no significance? If that is so, why do you get upset when you see injustice? Why do you cry when you hear lovely music? Or feel sad when a loved one dies. Why are you like this if you're just a cosmic speck of dust? You're like that because God has made you like that. He's put his image on you. You were made in his image. Even the most fallen of creatures. Even those wretches that have done horrible things. There's still the image of God in them. Albeit it's been ruined. But it's still there. You are human. You are unique. You are significant. You are precious. You are valued. And God values you. But you must come to him on his terms. You can't come bargaining. You come with empty hands. You come like, like Saul did at the beginning when he says, I'm, not the, I'm, not, I'm the least of the Benjamites. I'm, I'm, I'm nobody. I'm Mr. Nobody. But Samuel is to say, well, we're going to make you a king. And there's a sense in which there's a pattern there. We're all nobodies in that sense. And yet God is going to make us royal because that's what he talks about. Uh, God is the king of kings and we become his children when we trust in him. So can I plead with you just for a moment, if you're such a person, stop and think about your life. 
Think about what's going to be coming up in a couple of weeks' time with Christmas and all the razzmatazz of that. And then what happens in January when it's all gone and we're back to normal and the weather's cold and COVID's kicking in again and all the rest of it. Is that all there is to life? Just having these little spotlights of joy, Christmas, Easter, holidays, retirement, all the rest of it. God has got so much more to offer than even that. He's got the richest of gifts to give you. And that supreme gift is in Jesus Christ. Will you not at least consider those claims? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we just thank you for the fact that you, you struggle with us. We fight you off sometimes. We resist you. We, maybe there's someone here and they've been running away from God for years and years. Ah, oh, I pray, Lord, whoever they may be, that you'll touch their lives and change them even this day. And for us, for us who, those of us who know you, may we just be refreshed by realizing that we have this God who has such an intimate care and concern for our lives. What a great God. Here's we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.